price controls never work and uh, may end up causing more harm than than good. So her policy of uh, price controls is not going to work. On the other hand, what would President Trump do? Well, he said, look at the consumer price index. About 30 percent of it in the aggregate in total uh, is made up of energy prices, not just that we buy gasoline and heating oil, but business has to buy energy to produce the product. So when energy costs sure. go on, it costs more to produce products. So President Trump said there's no reason why energy is so high. The w- reason it is so expensive is when uh, the Biden administration, Biden and Harris, came in in January of 2021 they wanted to restrict the use of fossil fuels. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to and watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Hey, we're almost at the end of August. We've got an election going on. We don't really talk much about elections because this is a family show. And, uh, you know, the current political situation is obscene. But we do talk about economics. And there's a couple of policies. There's Kamalanomics and there's Trumponomics. We've already had a taste of both of them. I don't know which one you prefer, but uh, we do know which one, Professor Bustler, Michael Bustler, you prefer. So tell us here, are there two distinct economic policies or is one just mimicking the other? And uh, why should we care? So there are. Thanks for having me on your show, Carrie. So there are two distinct, distinctly different economic policies. So Before we look at it, um, what what is the goal of economic policy? That includes both monetary and fiscal policy. So what what, what are the goals of economic policy? They should be to keep prices stable, price stability, growth, and full employment. So um, let's start with price stability. We, We have had and almost continue to have a very severe inflation problem. Remember when Uh, At the end of 2020, uh, the last number we had for inflation, the inflation rate was running at about 1.4%. Starting in 2021, the inflation rate continued to go up steadily until June of 2022, when it peaked out at 9.1%. And the Federal Reserve said, uh, look, we're going to have to do something uh, about it. So they started raising interest rates, and it appears to have brought the inflation rate down Um, I think it's still a little too high and the Federal Reserve uh, shouldn't cut interest rates in September. Most people disagree with me and say that the inflation rate has come down and it's time to cut interest rates. So um, suppose inflation flares up again during the next administration. Kamala Harris policy is, well, if uh, corporations and business is going to continue to raise prices, Let's just pass a law that says it's illegal for you to raise prices. That way, she says, we'll solve the inflation problem. That was tried in the U.S. in 1971 by Richard Nixon. Uh, We had an inflation problem. He put on price controls. He froze prices uh, for about 90 days. So it was illegal to raise your price uh, during that period. And then he lifted it and prices ended up soaring. During the 90 days when the price controls were in effect, um, you ended up with uh, what we knew was was going to happen. Anytime you set a market price below the equilibrium, you end up with a shortage of the product. And for those of us that are old enough to remember, there were lines to get gasoline, depending on the last number on your license plate, told you what day you could buy uh, gasoline. So price controls never work. And uh, they end up causing more harm than than good. So her policy of uh, price controls is not going to work. On the other hand, what would President Trump do? Well, he said, look at the consumer price index. About 30 percent of it in the aggregate in total uh, is made up of energy prices, not just that we buy gasoline and heating oil, 
but business has to buy energy to produce the product. So when energy costs go on, it costs more to produce products. So President Trump said there's no reason why energy is so high. The reason it is so expensive is when uh, the Biden administration, Biden and Harris, came in in January of 2021, they wanted to restrict the use of fossil fuels. So they canceled the Keystone Pipeline, uh, which would have added another 900,000 barrels of oil a day. Um, They made the permitting process more difficult for oil companies, and they withdrew uh, leases to drill on federal lands. Well, that restricted the supply of uh, oil. And when you restrict the supply of anything, the price goes up. So President Trump said, look, let's just reverse all that. Go back to what I was going to do and started to do back in 2020. So we're going to start drilling more. We're going to improve the Keystone Pipeline. We'll bring energy prices down. And that should help significantly to uh, control the inflation uh, problem. So uh, President Trump will look at the causes of inflation rather than just saying we're not going to um, allow anyone to to raise prices. Um, And those price controls, as I said, don't work. Now, how about the next goal? Uh, Growth and full employment go together. Kamala Harris hasn't really given um, what her policies will be on um, economic growth uh, other than to say, uh, look, we, I know in some areas um, in the housing market, but for instance, we would like to see more houses being built and we'd like to see them less expensive so that um, more people will be able to afford new homes. To do that, she's going to give uh, $25,000 down payment assistance to every eligible, I'm not sure how she defines eligible, every uh, eligible home buyer. Yeah. Well, That'll actually make the problem worse. The reason uh, housing prices are going up so fast is that just the same reason why any right there's a far greater demand than there is supply. So she gives people uh, money to help buy houses that'll increase the demand and make prices go up even further. She says if we increase the demand, the supply will just catch up to that demand. They'll be able they'll be able to build three million uh, more houses. That's not likely to happen. So what does President Trump say? He says, look, a major component when you're buying a house is the cost of land. He says, I really can't do anything about the cost of the materials and labor is what it is. But the federal government owns a lot of land. If we release that land to home builders at a a lower cost, uh, that will give uh, home builders an incentive to start producing more houses that will increase the supply of houses and tend to, tend to bring the price uh, down. The other thing that influences economic growth significantly is tax policy. And there's a vast difference in what the two uh, candidates uh, are offering. Kamala Harris says um, she wants to do a lot more social programs, give uh, credits to uh, moms for uh, daycare and the um, down payment assistance. Um, so... so um, uh, her plan is to, um, in order to pay for that, she's going to have to raise taxes. Now, she says, well, I don't want to raise taxes on the middle class because I'm for the middle class and working people. Let's have the wealthy pay their fair share. Let's finally have the wealthy pay their fair share. We're going to raise those taxes. So I looked um, at the IRS um, in 2023. They didn't have 2024 data. But in 2023, the top 1% of income earners earned 26% of all income. That's a lot. They paid 46% of all income taxes paid. The top 20% ended up paying 80% of all the taxes paid. I don't know how she defines fair share, but I would say the top income earners are paying way more than their fair share. In fact, The lowest 47% of uh, income earners, nearly half, don't pay any federal tax at all. Now, they say, well, they pay Social Security and Medicare, and that's true. But the people that pay the high income taxes also pay Social Security and Medicare. Raising taxes will stagnate the economy. She wants to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 up to 28% in addition 
to raising taxes on the wealthy. And the last thing I heard her say was she wants to tax unrealized capital gains. So what does that mean? So if you have a an asset, uh, a house or land or something has a certain value, at the end of the year, the value's gone up. You haven't sold your house, you're living it, but the value's gone up. She wants people to pay taxes on how much the the value has gone up. Also very disastrous. On, um, the third uh, thing she said was, uh, in 2017, when it affected effect in 2018, President Trump convinced Congress to have a tax cut for all Americans. Essentially, what he said was, I'm going to cut everybody's taxes by 10%. So it's nice and fair. Everybody gets a 10% cut. In order to get it through Congress, they um, could only get it approved for a 10-year uh, period. So these will expire at the end of 2026. Kamala says she wants to let that expire. That will raise everybody who pays taxes. That'll raise their taxes by 10%. That will give people less money to spend and businesses less, and that will tend to uh, slow down economic activity. What does President Trump want to do? Make those Trump tax cuts permanent to keep everybody's tax rates down. Keep the uh, corporate tax rate at 21%. And only tax a capital gain when it's realized. When you've sold something, you have a capital gain, then ta- tax it. So his uh, policies will keep tax rates much lower. That will spur economic uh, growth. So it's a vast difference between what the two okay. candidates want. So let's go to this uh, wealth tax, because so that is probably the most disturbing thing. It says it's only going to be on people over $100 million. But look, you know, we know how this works. Trickle down economics. They're a big proponent of that, especially when it comes to uh, tax policy. Actually, the only time they're a proponent of trickle down economics, as they call it, is when it comes to taxes, meaning that everybody gets taxed eventually. So my house right now, you know, maybe went up 50 percent, but I'm not selling it. So then, uh, you know, and this applies and just say, hey, somebody's the value of somebody's shareholdings who's a billionaire went up 300 million. All right. They can't spend that money, although I guess in theory they could borrow on the value of their portfolio. But that's risky. Still so, haven't earned it. Yeah. It's, it's what I would call phantom income because it's income the government thinks you made, but it's income that never made it to your pocket. Uh, what's the wisdom of that? There's very little wisdom. Who this is really going to clobber is farmers because the value of land is going up considerably. But you have a farm that has been in a family for two, three, four generations, uh, and they don't want to sell it. They want to continue to to farm the land and provide food. If she starts taxing unrealized capital gain, farmers won't have money to pay the taxes. What are they going to have to do? They're going to have to sell off part Mm -hmm. of their land to pay the uh, taxes every year, and that will reduce the amount of uh, farmland available and eventually reduce the amount of food being produced. And when you reduce the supply of anything, the price is going to skyrocket. So all of her plans, she thinks she's being uh, good to the middle class. All of her plans will eventually clobber the middle class. You're going to end up with a stagnant economy. You're going to end up with a higher inflation uh, number. Um, and eventually then the unemployment rate is going to start to go up. And this is not, you know, just some theory. Uh, look at all the countries that have done stuff like this, and you can see what happens to those uh, countries. Hey, and I remember when Nixon uh, imposed the wage and price controls, and everybody thought, oh, this will really be good. But the fact is, um, it didn't work. Even by his own admission, it didn't yeah. work. And it ignores the cause of the uh, the real cause of inflation, which is uh, excessive uh, government spending, right? Uh, yeah. And printing money, uh, deficit spending, and all of this. Now, <clears throat> the one place where I kind of uh, take a little issue is uh, during uh, Trump's uh, tenure in office, obviously we had the pandemic, but that became a money giveaway free-for-all that has contributed to the underlying inflation. It's not just 
Biden-Harris, Trump is responsible to some extent for the inflation. Maybe not the bulk of it, but he was just lucky he got out with prices that we had. Here, increasing at 1.4%, largely because energy uh, consumption plunged and that sent oil prices skidding. Um, you know, there's some responsibility here, Michael, for Trump's actions. Okay, so um, why do we have this inflation? The real reasons we have inflation is the federal government deficit spent that has spent more money than they took in nearly $11 trillion from 2020, Trump's last year, up through the end of 2024. The fiscal year ends in September. $11 trillion more than they brought in in tax revenue. On a, an economy of about $25 trillion a year, that's going to add to pure inflation. Um, the other reason we have inflation is that when inflation started to tick up in early 2021, the Federal Reserve said, well, don't worry about it. It's temporary. We'll use the term transitory. We don't have to do anything. It'll just go yeah. away. So they didn't do anything. They kept interest rates near zero, which kept demand high, and they kept their bond buying program up. Finally, in June of 2022, the Federal Reserve recognized the economic goals include price stability, and they started to raise um, interest rates. Imagine that. <laughs> now, wh one last thing. He said, well, uh, Trump had a $3 trillion deficit in 2020, and that's really what started this. <clears throat> so here, here's the argument, the other side of that. Um, for whatever reason, the pandemic, et cetera, they shut the economy down completely. So output went from whatever it was almost down to, to zero. Unemployment went up to 14, 15 percent. Trump said, we need to fix this quickly. So what I want to see is what we call a V-shaped recovery. So we dipped very quickly. I want to see us come back very quickly. How do we do that? We have consumers and government and consumers start spending a lot of money. So he passed the $3 trillion stimulus package. It worked. And the economy came roaring, roaring back. Um, you can argue whether it was necessary or not, but at least that was his thinking. Mm -hmm. In 2021, when Biden took office, they keep saying inherited a terrible economy. That's not true. When Biden took office, the inflation rate was 1.4 percent. The economy was growing at a 6 percent annual rate. Mm -hmm. When Biden decided to pass the American Rescue Plan, the Inflation Reduction Act, another $3 trillion in stimulus, the economy was already growing. That led to just pure inflation. And then Biden just kept it up in the next uh, two, two years. And this year, he's still going to run another $2 trillion deficit. And there's absolutely no reason uh, for that. So you're right. The big deficit spending started with Trump. Now, obviously, I support his policies, but... Um, you could debate whether and argue whether he should have uh, had the stimulus or not. But after that stimulus, you didn't need any more uh, at all. So you're right. Trump is partially to blame. You can justify it by saying we wanted to get that V-shaped recovery. But you are accurate that Trump's uh, stimulus contributed to the inflation problem. Yeah. I mean, it, and look, like uh, it started it. But we're also we also live in a a world that's governed by cycles and we've had this low inflation rate over the past three decades almost four decades and lower interest rates all that now you could argue that the uh, inflation rate was understated during that time i don't think there's any question about it but uh you know it was just natural that to that lower interest rates were going to come to an end artificially lower interest rates they help spur inflation as well, right? So, Absolutely. so a lot of this is just, uh, hey, being in the wrong time at the wrong place. But that doesn't mean that just because there's a fire there, instead of taking the fire hose and extinguishing it, you take the gasoline pump and you pump more, uh, more feed for the fire there, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, had, if you believe that uh, the, the economy operates in cycles, which it does, and inflation would have come back eventually anyway, once it starts to come back, you take action at that point. You don't wait. The Federal Reserve waited a year and a half later. Uh, the fiscal policy, they're still deficit spending four years, uh, three and a half years after the um, 
inflation started. So what economists, especially the Federal Reserve, they're supposed to be ahead of this. Yeah. If there's any any sign of inflation, like in, in 2018, they passed these tax cuts. The economy was all set to take off. No signs of inflation. For some reason, the Federal Reserve starts pushing up interest rates. They were asked why. And they said, well, inflation could be a problem in the future. and We want to stead, stay ahead of this. Why they didn't take that view in 2021, I don't know. It's the same people there. And they took a much, um, a much different view. Hey, could not agree with you more. You know, I just want to place blame because inflation, deficit spending, that isn't one party or the other. They have been partners in it. Absolutely. Going back to uh, World War II, arguably before World, uh, you know, the Great Depression, all of this. And, you know, it, it's kind of like when you got a candy bar and you take that first uh, bite, it's delicious. And then you like gobble the whole thing down and you feel sick afterwards. So as a result of everything you said, we now have a $35 trillion public debt. That's the total of all deficits over time. Where did all this problem start? It actually started, and there's deficits in the past, but really in the early 60s. What happened then, John Kennedy was president. Women uh, decided, look, we don't have to stay at home. We can enter the workforce too if we want. So more women, women started entering the workforce. The unemployment rate started to go up. So Kennedy said, look, how do I stimulate the economy? And as economists, they were Keynesian economists, they said, look, just spend more money. And uh, Kennedy said, well, look, we don't have any more money. I don't want to raise taxes. And they told them it's OK to run a deficit. Why? Look, we owe the money to ourselves and we can always raise taxes to get rid of a deficit. So they convinced Kennedy that deficit spending was OK. Since that time, 1962 to uh 2024, what is that, 60, 62 years, we only balanced the budget four years out of those 62 years, and the deficits in the last decade have gotten much, much larger. We're going to have to confront this public debt problem sooner rather than later. What happened over the years is every president, they said, well, the deficit's run in, let's try to keep going, going. we'll kick the can down the road, let the next president worry about it. Next president gets in and says, okay, we have a deficit of problem. I don't want to raise taxes. I don't want to cut spending. We'll make the next guy worry about it. Yeah. They kept kicking the can down the road. The point is we're at the end of the road. There is no more road. We have to deal with this problem as soon as possible. It takes a lot of political courage to do that. Um, I'm hoping, um, I, I believe Trump's going to, I hope President Trump wins the election. And at some point he's going to have to confront that problem. Well, you know, one thing for sure, uh, you, you know, <laughs> the uh, the opposition here uh, can't even spell inflation, <laughs> let alone uh, wanting to uh, do something about it here, right? Yeah. Yeah, they don't really, um, the, the uh, current administration is not really interested uh, in reducing government spending. In fact, under Biden, um, government spending has skyrocketed. I think his next proposed budget for 2025 was, I think, $6.5 trillion. Uh, when he got in in uh, 2021, I think the budget was about $4.8 trillion. So he ended up massively increasing government spending, and that led to larger deficits. He's going to end up as four years having about $7.8 trillion in debt, he added. He says Trump added more. That's not accurate. Trump added about five point six uh, trillion dollars. Yeah. The point is, somebody's going to have to face this and do what we have to do to get the um, deficit down. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Well, hey, it's actually pretty easy because in the age of AI and Chat GPT, I asked Chat GPT to analyze the twenty twenty five uh, federal budget. And come up with two to three trillion dollars worth of cuts, and uh, and to not raise taxes because the first time I said I want to balance the budget, some something got into this uh, Chat GPT because it just wanted to raise taxes. Yeah, and here we cut uh, corporate welfare by six hundred billion. All right, we cut defense spending by about eight hundred billion, and still have plenty left over. Uh, 
healthcare spending seven hundred billion, discretionary uh, federal spending seven hundred billion, and Social Security and Medicare reform four hundred billion, and I saved three point two trillion, and I didn't even break a sweat here, Michael. Yeah, I'll tell you, all those things you mentioned, Kerry, are going to be very difficult. It says let's <laughs> cut the military budget. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a few wars here and cutting the military. What's the war? war. <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to be difficult too. So Trump can do it. Healthcare spending, um, politically, I don't know how you're going to do that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, well, that's going to be very, very difficult. So I think up with some numbers, but actually doing it politically will be very difficult. What I think is mm-hmm. if they just hold the line on spending for the next few years let the economy grow and tax revenue come up. Eventually, you'll come very close to balancing the um, the budget. You're going to have to cut some things out, but still, um, you need to do that because we have to face this deficit and debt problem sooner rather than later. Look, the, the interest on the public debt this year, 2024, was $660 billion. At the rate we're going and the fact that when the government borrows money, there's no plan in place to ever pay the money back. No plan in place to ever pay it back. They sell a 10 or 20 year bond. The bond matures. They don't have money to pay it back. They sell new bonds and pay off the old bonds or roll over the public debt. There's a lot of problems with that. One major is much of this old debt was taken out of one, one and a half percent interest. And they are going to be three, four percent interest. So you're going to double or triple the interest expense, even if you don't take out any more uh, debt. So um, we've got to get a get a handle on on this problem. Um, and the first thing to do is stop deficit spending, and at least get it reduced, and then we'll work on getting the debt down. Okay, I guess we'll leave it at that. Hey, uh, we find your work over at Newsmax, uh, Professor Bosler. Uh, Newsmax. I write a column usually one or two uh, a week. Newsmax Finance. Um, you can you can see me there. I do have a Facebook page where I uh, post all my columns. To just search for on Facebook, funding democracy, funding sure. democracy, funding democracy on Facebook. The links race. the links are in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. When you go there, please uh, sign up for our free newsletter. Professor Bussler, always an interesting conversation. We'll talk to you again real soon. I hope so. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.